トビデオ The jack o lanterns are lit, the candy's in the bowl, the VHS is in the VCR. It's October, and it's time for another spooktacular edition of Kyoto Video, digging up and reappraising horror anime from the distant past. But leading up to this month, a thought crossed my mind. Does anyone feel like there's a shockingly little overlap between anime fans and horror movie fans? Well, okay, it's not that shocking. Anime is, after all, a broad medium encompassing multiple genres, while horror is just one of those genres. But I just find it strange that whenever people talk about horror, horror anime rarely, if at all, seems to come up. Horror anime seems to be regarded more as anime than horror. And we all know how most non-anime fans regard anime. You dirty creep! You're not a normal human, are you? I told you. I was a zombie, remember? It's frustrating because anime fans and horror fans are not that different. Look deep down in both fandoms and you'll see that we share many similarities from our willingness to consume crap media to our resilient nostalgia for 80s media and its accompanying aesthetic. Horror fans are really denying themselves the pleasure of indulging themselves in bloody disgusting titles like Vampire Hunter D, Wicked City, and Devilman, not to mention other titles I haven't even gotten to yet. So allow me to introduce horror fans to an anime that's just a pure horror show for the eyes, in a good way, that can act as an olive branch to bring our two fandoms closer together. <laughs> In the waning days of the Yayoi period, the ancient land that would soon become Japan was ruled from the shadows by a secret cult of shamans. Although they were eventually eradicated, some hangers-on survived and have spent centuries hoping to regain their lost power by performing a dark ritual to summon the four holy beasts into human bodies. Another attempt at the ritual has been scheduled in Shinjuku, Tokyo circa 1989. The cult has once again risen and are attempting to find the incarnation of the vermilion bird Suzaku to complete the ritual. The leader of the cult, a shady businessman named Mikichi Yoye, has learned that the reincarnation of the white tiger Biako is a young sculptor named Kiyoichi Hiyu and that he might be connected to the other beasts. One of them is a monk named Gendo, Hiyu's sensei and the reincarnation of the black turtle Genbu. The other is Hiyu's girlfriend Shiho Murase, who is the reincarnation of Suzaku, and exactly whom Miki, who is also the reincarnation of Azure Dragon Seiru, is looking for. It becomes a rush to rescue Shiho as Hiyu and Gendo gear up for the supernatural clash of the ages to prevent Miki and his cult from renewing their dark covenant. Grotesque monstrosities, dark power play, and gallons upon gallons upon gallons of blood soon follows. <laughs> First released in 1987 and completed in 1989, Mar Yusenki, translated directly to the more blunt Evil Dragon War Chronicles, is the kind of classic 80s VHS nonsense that makes me wonder why did the Western Hemisphere miss out on this title? This is yet another example of an anime that never got an official release outside of Japan and, as far as I know, has completely stayed off all disc-based media formats outside of Laserdisc. I just find it perplexing that this anime never got any release in the states because come on look at it Mira. This was an anime meant to have its clips sliced up and put into an advertisement blaring the prodigy's voodoo people at you. The VH cover to this anime needs to be wrapped in shrink wrap and have a big honking sticker with the words not for kids slapped over it. Alas, that is not the world we live in and I think there's a reason for that. Not a lot of information can be found about this anime, but the little I could gather suggests that Mario Senki was not just a failure in sales, but also a failure in sales that carried with it a very troubled production. This was the only directorial work of Hiroaki Ogami, and the production ended up changing hands from AIC to Bandai Visual after a two year period in limbo. 
all signs point to some seriously fraught goings-ons behind the scenes, which is why this 80s horror OVA series has slipped into obscurity. Not just a cruel fate, but an undeserving one as well, because Mario Sinki, in spite of its troubles, isn't that bad. It's not solid gold or anything, but it's a serviceable anime to watch on Halloween. It's got great atmosphere, plenty of action, and did I mention the blood? <laughs> Mario Sinki began as an entry in AIC's Pink Noise series of OVAs. If that name rings a bell, you may be remembering another Pink Noise OVA that Kyoto Video has covered in the past. Please call, me tonight. call Me Tonight and Mario Sinki are definitely sister anime, even barring the Pink Noise connection. Both are budget supernatural horror titles set in 1980s Japan and are drenched in the visuals and taste of that period. <laughs> but whereas Call Me Tonight carries an ambiance that can best be described as city pop horror, the aura of Mario Sinki is Old Japan mixing with New Japan. Or Old New Japan. The anime is characterized by striking visuals of old monks fighting ninjas in pedestrian tunnels, or ancient temples hidden in plain sight in Tokyo back alleys. What helped make these images stick into your mind is the level of detail they are given even with their limited budget. The drawings of Mario Sinki are really good for what they are, almost to an unnecessary degree. A car rolling down the highway is given the same amount of detail as an old ninja's graphic transformation into a demonic yokai. We can credit all of this to animation director and character designer Naoyuki Onda. Just like with Toy that came out that same year, Onda's involvement really keeps this anime from being just another piece of video store filler. His commitment to maintaining a level of realism in the designs of his characters and their environments is what makes the moments of supernatural horror pop. Even with the limitations of a mid-tier anime title, the visceral nature is all there. <laughs> Ondo was retained on Mario Sinki for all three episodes, even when the project moved from AIC to Bandai. Because of that, a lot of the vibes and animation that made Episode 1 such a visual treat were kept in the transfer. It really comes to life in the final episode, where we get to see Miki's temple, and we see Onda, along with art director Yuichi Nangu, turn a traditional Shinto temple into this unsettling nightmare hellscape. All of which is done with even less budget than the first episode. The Pink Noise OVAs were not real big successes since none of them ever made it off VHS, and that's reflected in the second and third episodes of Mario Sinki, where the team was given just enough to finish everything and little else. But thanks to Onda and company being economically minded through their cinematography and where to really animate their hearts out, it's not that noticeable. If you completely ignore all the moments where it's very noticeable, even the first episode is not immune to some problems with its visuals. A lot of the color grading is rendered way too dark and it can make quite a few scenes difficult to parse. And while the animation looks good in 95% of the scenes, there are a few awkward moments. Nice gate lady. One more thing that gives Mario Sinki its unique flavor is the music of Norimasa Yamanaka. He is responsible for giving Call Me Tonight its city pop horror stylings through its soundtrack, and just like with that anime, his music helps solidify Mario Sinki's ancient Japan horror in modern Japan's atmosphere. Giving music that can range from primal traditional music played on synths, to unnerving droning that feels both futurist yet older than Japan itself. It's good, except for this one track that sounds like someone just pressing random keys on their Casio. No joke, it may as well be a track from Resident Evil's director's cut. <gasps> So before I actually watched Mario Sinki, I actually skimmed over the plot summary just to know what exactly I was getting into. 
The synopsis I gave y'all at the beginning is pretty much the abridged version of all that, but it really feels a lot more complicated than it actually is. The anime begins with a behemoth of a wall of text explaining everything I just explained to you without having to animate anything, and it really doesn't need it because you can totally understand everything that's going on without that backstory. There's a young hero who needs to rescue his girlfriend from the evil overlord, and he will be accompanied on this quest by his old sensei. It's as simple as that. Just ignore that background information, it only serves just to make the story seem more complex than it actually is. I think the only thing you really do need to have some prior knowledge of to enjoy this anime is to have some passing familiarity of who the four heavenly beasts are, which if you've interacted with any sort of media from Japan in the past three decades, should be a snap. What makes this story work as a piece of horror is that it's a story of good versus evil, and that evil is extremely evil. Mario Senki has a lot of elements that you would find in a story like Berserk. The good guys are human beings with exceptional abilities, but are nevertheless still human beings at the end of the day. The forces of evil, meanwhile, have powers none of this earth on their side. Wielders of ancient forgotten magic from the ages prior to civilization. Miki is a villain who has clearly forsaken his humanity in the pursuit for power if he was even human to begin with. How else can you describe a group of people who lure a drunken party girl to their temple, perform a dark ritual on her against her will, and turn her into a demonic ninja warrior? But our heroes do have one thing that our villains don't have, and that's... Biker Monks. Oh yeah, accompanying Hiyo and Gendo are two monks who ride motorcycles and do martial arts, one of whom even dresses the part of a biker and even incorporates his motorcycle skills into his fighting style. Man, sometimes 80s anime is just too far ahead of everyone else. But what makes Mario Senki work as a piece of horror media is that a lot of the fights have this appearance of being nearly one-sided. Even though Hyo and Gendo have the powers of their reincarnations at their side, every fight against Miki and his cult feels like a huge struggle. Gendo and his monks can usually come out on top, partially because a major plot point is that Gendo was the one who single-handedly put a stop to the ritual the last time it happens, but Hyo's fights against Miki almost seem to be helplessly mismatched. It's clear Hyu is a strong fighter, but Miki completely curb stomps him in nearly every match they have. This really causes things to take a turn when Hyu resurrects as a feral man beast, and the second episode turns into a werewolf movie. <laughs> And the whole third episode with the final confrontation at Miki's temple ends up being the surrealist horror that threatens to rip straight from the pages of Nobuhiku Obayashi. There's an entire sequence where Miki's assistant priestess merges with his office and becomes an evil room monster. Mario Senki really succeeds in being unsettling, dare I say, even scary. At the same time though, I can't ignore the serious maladies it has in telling its story. On one hand, the fact that this OVA series was able to weather serious production difficulties and not come away with any major story problems is commendable in and of itself. But story problems still exist either way. First, let's go back to that giant wall of text in the beginning. When I said it was unnecessary to understanding the plot, I mean it's just completely superfluous. Just a lot of overly detailed lore that could easily be explained through a few lines of dialogue within the anime itself. I think the only real thing that can be said about this text is that it gives us context for why this ritual needs to happen for Miki, but I think he makes his intentions clear within his first scene. <laughs> Also, as much as Mario Senki can deliver on all the chills and thrills, it takes forever to really get going. At least one half of the first episode is devoted to some extremely blunt exposition about what the deal is, what's going on, and it only makes me want to harp on that wall of text at the beginning still being unnecessary. <laughs> But after we get all that exposition out of the way, that's when the anime really gets going. Yet the story problems don't go away. 
I think having the production change hands makes that clear. At the end of the first episode, there is a sneak preview of what is to be the next episode of Mario Senki, and none of that footage makes it into episode 2. All roads point to whatever story there was planned being thrown out in the switch from AIC to Bandai. Screenwriter Sho Aikawa actually asked to be uncredited after he learned that most of his script had been cut from episode 2 onwards. You make the call if that's a net positive or not. For what it's worth, the story they do end up coming away with is solid enough, but it is not immune to storytelling troubles. From the preview from episode 1, it looked like Miki was successful in kidnapping Shiho. But since episode 1 ended with Hiyu and Miki's match ending in an explosive draw, Shiho is now safe with Gendo and Hiyu and Miki resurrecting into their new forms, Hiyu becoming the aforementioned Beast Man, and Miki looking like he got a dose of the gender fluid. By the end of episode 2, these plot developments mean absolute jack. Shiho manages to stick around Gendo for most of the episode, absorbing even more exposition along the way, when yoink, she's back in Miki's clutches again. And the fulcrum of episode 2's drama is Hugh becoming this uncontrollable monster, and his allies trying and failing to bring him back to normal. That is, until he no longer is an uncontrollable monster. <laughs> So I guess we can call episode 2 a detour, I guess. The biggest bullshit plot shenanigan happens in the final episode, though. The episode is pretty much non-stop horror and action until it gets to a point where it feels the need to pull an absolute knuckle-headed twist straight out of the dark recesses of its butt by revealing that Gendo has actually been dead this entire time. Turns out he actually lost the battle he fought a decade ago, and the Gendo that's been around us this entire time is actually a walking corpse brought to life by magic or whatever, and that he was actually a decoy created by Miki's family to find the other beasts. Ignoring how that turn in the plot makes zero sense. Why was Miki even searching for the other beasts if he had already had the perfect decoy with him for the past 18 years? It's easily the point where the original script being thrown out becomes obvious. A two year break in production does make the story vulnerable to these kinds of snags in the story. It's all a means for Miki to tell Hiyu that he, as the White Tiger, has been destined to lose against the Azure Dragon in a fight. Hiyu tries to offer a rebuttal by punching him, but that gets difficult once Miki rips both his arms off. It looks like all is lost, but Shiho awakens her powers and ends up defeating Miki because Destiny has a major loophole, and we end up getting one of the bluntest downer innings to an 80s OVA I've ever seen. Shiho, you met her Aona. BAM! Right to credits. It just ends. Just like other classic 80s horror, there's no need for an epilogue here. The story's over and everybody's dead, Dave. Happy Halloween. The squirrely bits of the plot aside, I can't see why Mario Sinki shouldn't be considered a must-watch for the October season. It's tense, it's got lots of blood, and the whole visual motif just fits that 80s style of horror like a glove. It's like the Yoshiaki Kawajiri film that never was. Heck, Kawajiri himself was a fan of the original 1987 OVA and specifically asked for Ondo when he was prepping for his feature film, Demon City Shinjuku, that was to be released next year. Mario Senki's existence is a pleasant surprise. It had so much working against it and it almost fell victim to those forces. What we get out of it is a pretty serviceable horror anime that sets the right mood for a midnight movie. Any horror fan worth their salt needs to check this out and see what they think. While it might be fun to explore the standards and revisit the classic nostalgia, Mario Senki shows us that sometimes it's stepping outside your comfort zone that gets you something truly unique. Also, it's got lots of blood. What more do you need? 